So moving on, um, if I'd put up a slide of declarations, one of the things I'd have declared was that I'm a trustee at Cure Parkinson's Trust, which is a um, purely research-based third sector uh, organization. Um, and I have been attending the um, research grant application meetings, which have been fascinating. Uh, it's been quite a, quite a couple of years, actually. Um, we sadly lost our founder, Tom Isaacs, who's already been mentioned and who I'm sure Alan will mention in his talk. Uh, but we've seen some fantastic steps forward in terms of repurposing drugs. Uh, some of you may have been involved in the um, Joint Neurology Academy uh, CPT meeting we had in Sheffield in December basically because some of these drugs are now getting out into uh, phase three trials, so they're actually going to start to impact on clinicians. Also over that time, we've appointed our first deputy director of research, um, Simon Stott, and Simon's going to talk to us about how we can target the disease mechanisms in Parkinson's disease, because that's kind of the way in to repurposing drugs that are already available and have already been through safety profiles. Simon, the floor's mm -hmm. yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to the uh, Parkinson's Academy and Bial for um, organising the event and inviting us to speak. Uh, although I have to admit, I've always felt sorry for any presenters who follow Professor Bass Bloom. <laughs> and um, woe, I find myself between Bass Bloom and the coffee break. Um, so it's not an ideal situation, you can imagine. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how researchers are um, trying to target the disease mechanisms of Parkinson's. Um, firstly, just my only real disclosure is that I am an employee of the pa Cure Parkinson's Trust, and um, we have currently 16 different compounds and 17 clinical trials. Um, and where I mention them in this talk, there'll be the Cure Parkinson's logo. Um, oops. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from New Zealand, um, where I worked for a biotech company called Neuron Pharmaceuticals. So we're taking the tripeptide of IGF-1 uh, to the clinic for neurodegenerative conditions. Um, and that's where I developed an interest in Parkinson's. To my mind, um, of all the neurodegenerative conditions we were researching at the time, it was the uh, easiest problem to solve. Uh, Fifteen years later, I can appreciate the naivety of that um, first thought. but. Um, my interest took me to Sweden, where I worked with um, Professor Anders Bjorklund and Dennis Kerrick um, during my PhD studies, Anders being one of the <clears throat> founding fathers of cell transplantation for Parkinson's, and Dennis being a pioneer in both GDNF and gene therapy work in this um, area. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, that's better. Um, a couple of postdocs, and my last one being with uh, Professor Roger Barker at um, the University of Cambridge, where for um, the last four years I was helping out in the clinic. Uh, I'd gone to um, Roger and said that um, after 10 years of working with Parkinson's, I've never really met anyone with the condition. Do you mind if I help um, in the clinic? And uh, Roger was very enthusiastic. Um, and this exposed me to a population of people um, that I was most surprised um, were desperate for information. There's a really desperate thirst. Um, and that led me to start writing um, on a website called The Science of Parkinson's, which I keep. Um, and that um, is partly responsible for why uh, the Cure Parkinson's Trust came to me and said, would you be interested in working with us? And I leapt at the opportunity. You are all familiar with <clears throat> the biology of um, Parkinson's, the pathology, so I'm going to skip over all of the uh, background slides, and I'm going to jump straight into um, my presentation. Uh, I, I warn you now, it's going to be a bit of a shopping list. This is a largely clinician-based audience, and I'm going to be focusing my talk around the research that's being done at the clinical trial level, um, the various ways and means that we are um, targeting disease mechanism in Parkinson's. Uh, we don't know what the disease mechanisms are in Parkinson's, but there is a lot of activity going on at the clinical trial level. And so consider this an overview, a brief overview, an update on where things are. Now, we know that Parkinson's is a progressive condition, um, both in the clinic, we see deterioration, but also histologically. Um, for example, in the putamen here, you can see the loss of dopaminergic fibers, comparing A and D um, panels there. Um, one 
possible remedy for the situation was to transplant dopamine cells from uh, aborted fetuses um, into this putamen region. This uh, panel just here, you can see the transplanted cells over time have um, developed into dopamine neurons and re-innovated the um, area. And in some cases, this led to um, clinical improvements. But um, what has recently been discovered, um, as these individuals who were transplanted in the 1990s have passed on, is that these healthy cells, these cells that have been transplanted into this um, diseased brain, effectively, have started to show some of the hallmarks of Parkinson's. So here you can see um, alpha-synuclein um, aggregates. This over here is a section from the midbrain, dopamine neurons in the midbrain, which show Lewy bodies and Lewy pathology as um, labelled by alpha-synuclein, which is kind of the public enemy number one with regards to the pathology of Parkinson's. But in these new transplanted cells, we see the appearance of what uh, look like um, Lurie bodies. And <clears throat> so this begs the question, is it something intrinsic about cells that um, results in Lurie pathology? Or is it something extrinsic, extrinsic? Is it something about the disease brain that's being passed on to the cell? Um, and this has led some, some researchers to propose a prion-like spreading of Parkinson's, where this misfolded toxic form of alpha-synuclein is being passed from the diseased brain into these healthy cells. And perhaps this is one way in which the progression of the condition is occurring biologically. So the question becomes, how do we stop that progression? How can we slow it down for these individuals? And one um, approach that's being tested in the clinic at the moment is immunotherapy. And um, there are um, numerous um, clinical programs underway with regards to this approach of boosting the immune system. Um, but I'm going to describe just the first two, uh, the, excuse me, the two that are leading the, um, the pack. Um, the first of these is the Pasadena study, which is being conducted in um, the US. Um, this is being um, run by R the big pharma Roche and a small biotech company called Prathena. It's at the phase two level. There's 300 people involved, and every month for um, a, a year, they are being infused with um, antibodies for the toxic form of alpha-synuclein. And that will hopefully be um, reporting at the end of 2000 or early 2021. The second of these studies is um, the SPARC study, which is being conducted by Biogen. And again, this is 300 plus people at the phase two level, and that'll be reporting at the end of 2022. But as I said, this is a crowded field. There are a number um, of um, additional clinical trial programs underway. And on top of this, there are um, clinical trial programs in development as well. Um, on, uh, these are, the ones I've just mentioned are all um, passive Im um, immunotherapy approaches. There is also um, an active immunization approach. There is a um, company in um, Austria called Aphoris, and they are developing this vaccine, effectively, for Parkinson's. Um, they are still at the phase one level. They're being very, very cautious. They've um, done multiple studies at phase one, and they're now up to four years of um, post-treatment in their first cohort. Uh, over 100 people have been immunized, and thus far, it seems to be very safe and tolerable. But the big concern with the immunotherapy approach is that thus far, in Alzheimer's, absolutely everything has failed. And in one case, it potentially made the situation worse. Um, so why should Parkinson's be any different? Uh, one possibility is that the, um, that not enough antibodies are actually getting into the brain. Um, and this is where companies are focusing on small molecule approaches. One of those um, companies, and the one that's probably leading the pack, is um, Interin. They have a small molecule, ENT01, which is a synthetic version of a protein that's been derived from the dogfish shark here. Uh, dogfish sharks have got a very primitive immune system, but they basically never get sick. Um, I'm not sure how much of a wives' tale that is, because I'm not sure how you determine how sick <laughs> sharks can get, but this is what I'm told. Um, 
that, co that compound is called, um, oh, good grief, mental blank, squalamine. <laughs> so that compound's called squalamine, um, and it has got potent um, antimicrobial um, properties, but um, what some researchers in the US um, discovered was that it also has very, very potent um, anti-aggregation properties for alpha-synuclein, not only um, preventing aggregation, but also suppressing the toxicity associated with that aggregation. And so um, Interim generated a synthetic version of this, and they've um, started, they conducted a phase one study, found that it was very safe and tolerable, and now they're conducting a phase two study. But this study is focused on constipation in Parkinson's, because squalamine has one limiting factor, and that is that it doesn't enter the brain. So they're focusing on the gastrointestinal system um, with regards to this compound. And at the same time, <coughs> they have um, derivatives of squalamine, um, one of which is gyroscamine, and that is being developed now um, as a brain-penetrant small molecule um, um, oligomer, oligomer inhibitor. There are also other companies Two of them currently at clinical trial level, and um, the Proclara approach is quite interesting. They have um, what is called, what is referred to, they have a compound that has a motif that's referred to as a general amyloid um, interacting motif. Um, so it doesn't just focus on alpha synuclein, it'll, it'll bind to um, any amyloid protein, beta amyloid, any of them, and inhibit um, its aggregation. So it'll be interesting to see what a general anti aggregate um, inhibitor could uh, potentially do in humans. Um, in addition to boosting the immune system, there are approaches to reducing um, the immune response, um, which are being referred to as immunomodulation. And this stems from evidence that um, folks who have been immunosuppressed for a while uh, have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's. And <clears throat> one of the compounds that's been um, tested at the clinical level is um, sigramistin. Uh, Preclinical data suggested that it was having a beneficial effect. Um, and then they did a small uh, clinical trial. The um, reasoning here, or the, the theory here, is that as um, in Parkinson's, as healthy neurons become sick and um, die, they um, activate resting, excuse me, they activate resting um, microglia, as well as um, the immune system itself, with the release of toxic alpha synuclein, et cetera. And they, then you have an increase in um, inflammatory cytokines, and you have this sort of perpetual cycle. And what Sigramson does is reduces um, both of these pathways. And in the phase one clinical trial, which was, it's, it's a very small trial, only conducted over 12 weeks in 20 participants, and it was open label as well. Um, it was found to be very safe and well tolerated, and the um, individuals receiving Sigramistin were very enthusiastic about it. Uh, the only problem with the study was that um, almost all of the participants developed antibodies to Sigramistin, and so we need a reformulation um, of this therapy before we can sort of take it forward. Um, so those are two approaches that researchers are looking at with regards to the immune system, immunotherapy and immunomodulation. Um, another uh, method of um, potentially targeting the disease mechanisms of Parkinson's involve boosting autophagy. Um, one of the characteristic features, as I was saying before, of Parkinson's is the accumulation of protein. Um, not only alpha-synuclein, but SOD1 has been found in Lurie bodies, um, also ubiquitin. And um, folks who have um, the folks who have Parkinson's also have very high risk of actually having a um, genetic variant in one of the lysosomal storage disorder genes. Um, almost a quarter of them have more than one. One of those genes, in particular, is called um, GBA or glu glucose cerebrosidase. It is associated with um, Gaucher's disease lysosomal storage disorder condition. Um, but 5 to 8% of people with Parkinson's will also have GBA uh, mutations. And those individuals generally are diagnosed five years earlier. 
they have postural and gait difficulties, and um, they quite often have a more progressive form of the condition. Um, cognitive aspects can come into it as well. <coughs> Excuse me, one compound, um, and this is a Cure Parkinson's Trust supported um, drug, um, one compound that's been shown to have beneficial effects with regards to um, glucose urobicidase levels is the respiratory treatment and broxol. Um, in both preclinical and primate models, um, oral and broxol has been found to raise GKS levels in um, animals, and we have recently had the results of a phase two study um, come back to us, and they're about to be published, and we're quite uh, smiley about those results. Um, also in the GBA um, field is this gentleman here, Jonathan Silverstein. He's one of the, uh, he is a biotech investor in New York, uh, partner at um, Orbimed, and he set up um, the Silverstein Foundation after he discovered, after he was diagnosed with, in, with early onset Parkinson's in the uh, early 40s, um, and he discovered that it was a, he was um, carrying a GBA um, variant himself. And they are taking um, quite a bold approach towards correcting this lysosomal issue, um, and that they are going to take a gene therapy um, method where they're taking AAV, a deno associated virus, um, and they are going to be delivering it intra, um, cisternally, cisternally into um, CNS. And this is a wild type copy of the GBA gene that's being um, encoded. And um, that trial has just been given um, NDA um, clearance by the FDA, and they'll be starting before the end of the year, hopefully. Um, other companies taking GBA approaches include um, Sanofi and LTI. Um, and one, not necessarily a GBA approach, but more of a general autophagy approach um, is Restore Bio. This is an mTOR um, inhibi inhibition uh, play, um, where they have um, an mTORC1 inhibitor being tested in phase one level in um, New Zealand, and that trial is involving folks with GBA variants. Uh, nilotinib has been getting a lot of press. This is a cancer drug, a C-ABLE inhibitor, um, that in 2016 um, was tested in folks with Parkinson's in a phase one uh, trial, and had a very, um, well, there were suggestions of a very positive result. Um, there are currently two phase two trials ongoing, testing um, the validity of those results. One has been conducted by Georgetown, the other has been um, conducted by Northwestern University with Michael J. Fox, Kier Parkinson's Trust, and the Van Andel Institute. Um, and those results should be coming to us, uh, the first results should be coming out um, next year, not necessarily 2019, but 2020. Um, and this C able approach for boosting autophagy is Gained, garnered a lot of attention um, and resulted in quite a few um, additional pharmaceutical companies um, developing uh, C-ABLE inhibitors for Parkinson's. So there's quite a lot of activity in this domain as well. A, what are we up to? Third or fourth approach, third approach, excuse me, is um, LARC2 inhibition. And you might be familiar with this gentleman here. This is Sergey Brin, who was one of the co-founders of a small company called Google. Um, in, when he was growing up, Sergei um, had an auntie who had Parkinson's, and in 1999, his mother was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And in the early 2000s, he and his mother had their DNA sequenced, and what they found was that they were both carriers of the G2019S uh, variant for LARC2. So he has been pouring vast amounts of money um, into Parkinson's um, in the hope of... Um, that he doesn't necessarily need to um, worry about it in the future. Not everybody with the G2019S variant will go on to develop Parkinson's, but we could call this an insurance policy, basically. And um, this is having tremendous benefits for um, everybody in the community as it has resulted in a lot of positive data and, our, and a great 
increase in our understanding of LARC2, which is um, leucine rich repeat kinase 2. Um, this is a protein that does a lots of different things, but um, primarily it's um, investigated for its enzymatic um, properties. And carriers generally are diagnosed at an earlier stage, and they have a more mild motor form of the condition, um, but there's more dystonia and more sleep issues. Uh, but this can vary from population to population, is it, um, the penetrance and the um, prevalence of it. Uh, so it's, it, is a, it is a tricky one to actually investigate. Um, but one uh, company, Denali, this is a group of former Genetech um, employees, have um, really taken the bull by the horns with regards to um, LARC2 and developed an inhibitor, DNL201, uh, um, which is re reducing, um, it's blocking the uh, enzymatic reaction. And that is currently being tested in phase one trials as we speak. Um, but also in, in the background, at the moment, we have multiple companies that are also investigating this area. And one of those is GlaxoSmithKline, who have just recently registered a clinical trial for an antisense oligonucleotide approach for LARC2 um, in collaboration with Ionis. This is the, um, one of the companies behind the um, HD work last year that, was, um, that got a lot of media attention. Um, and then there's additional companies who are also developing LARC2 inhibitors. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention GLP-1 agonists. Um, Glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists are frontline treatment for um, diabetes. And um, more recently, it's been apparent that uh, preclinically at least, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that these um, compounds have um, tremendous benefits with regards to reducing oxidative stress, um, reducing amyloid plaques. Um, and that led to, well, preclinical studies in um, models of Parkinson's led to a phase one clinical trial, which suggested that not only was the um, treatment safe and well tolerated in people with Parkinson's, but there was the um, signs that it was having a beneficial effect. And then there was the study which was published in 2017 um, from Tom Fultonet's group in London, where they found that at least on the motor scores, on nothing else but just on the motor scores, um, part three of the UPDRS, there was a stabilization in the treated population um, at, while the control population continued to deteriorate. And uh, now efforts are being made for a larger phase three trial of this. Uh, but this um, result, this clinical trial program has resulted in others and um, three of those are being conducted, two of them in um, France and uh, the US in California. Um, Nova Nordisk has recently started a large um, semaglutide study in Norway. Semaglutide has the benefit over um, the Biduran approach in that semaglutide, I think you take it once every two weeks, as opposed to Biduran, which is once a month, uh, once a week, excuse me. And then there's a um, third um, player in this, um, Neurally, who have got a more brain penetrant GLP-1 agon agonist um, coming through into clinical development as we speak. A fifth, I warned you this was going to be a shopping list, a fifth approach for um, targeting disease mechanisms in Parkinson's is supporting uh, mitochondria. As we grow old, the power stations of each cell in our body um, start to um, fail or perform at a suboptimal rate, and mitochondrial DNA deletions are very apparent, not only in aged populations, but particularly in um, folks with Parkinson's. Um, Isodeoxycholic acid, or UDCA, is a bile acid that's used for breaking down gallstones, and um, it was found to be um, an inhibitor of apoptosis by modulating the mitochondrial membrane. And um, a screen by um, researchers in Sheffield found that it, was, um, it had tremendous benefits in the preclinical stage, at least, in models of Parkinson's, which uh, led to a phase one clinical trial in um, Minnesota, uh, which is reporting this year, hopefully. 
and also the, the initiation of a phase two trial um, in Sheffield and London um, uh, this year. And again, this is a CPT supported study. Another mitochondrial play is um, nicotinamide riboside. It is a form of uh, vitamin B3, obviously, uh, cofactor in the passing of, um, in the process of passing hydrogen electrons in the production of ATP. And um, a um, very large um, phase two study is being conducted currently in uh, Norway, the NOPARC study, where this supplement is being given to folks in a double blind fashion for um, a year and hopefully we'll be seeing the, report, the, the results of that study in 2021. One that you might not have heard of is Epi589. This is a um, compound that's being developed by Bioelectron. This is, there's a great story behind this company. This company was set up by a group of families um, who were affected by uh, mitochondrial disease in their children, and they were um, appalled at the lack of actual research being conducted um, for curative therapies for their for these conditions, and so they started a biotech company. And EP589 is an interesting compound that um, the director of research at the Cure Parkinson's Trust, Richard uh, Wise, approached the company and said, why don't we test this in Parkinson's? And a safety study, a phase two safety study and biomarker study was um, conducted in folks with um, genetic forms of Parkinson's. It's an early onset PD. And um, we'll hopefully have the results of that um, before the end of the year as well. Um, neurotrophic factors, I do not want to steal any thunder from um, Alan's talk, so I will skip over um, the GDNF study. Um, but but I, I will only mention that um, GDNF, uh, the, um, the, the Bristol study hasn't stopped in, uh, investigative work on GDNF. There is currently a um, phase two gene therapy approach being set up um, both in the States and in Europe um, for GDNF. Um, this is based on the results of <clears throat> a phase one study of, in 13 individuals that was published maybe two weeks ago. And also there's a company in um, Scandinavia, um, GeneCode, which is developing GDNF mimics. These are small molecule, orally available small molecules that mimic um, the uh, properties of GDNF. In addition, in Scandinavia, in um, Finland, there's a company called Horantis, which is conducting a clinical trial for um, CDNF. Um, this is involving 18 individuals in both Finland and Sweden. Um, and it's using the same apparatus that was used in the um, GDNF Bristol trial. The safety results of that study have been presented uh, this year at the ADPD meeting in Lisbon. And the full results um, will be made available mid-2020. Um, um, cell replacement therapy, uh, this is the last of the uh, approaches I'll be discussing. Um, uh, the Parkinson's community puts a lot of faith in stem cell based approaches um, and we currently have at least five ongoing clinical trial programs for cell transplantation. Uh, there is the TransEuro study which is being conducted here in um, Cambridge and also over in Sweden uh, which is using the old approach which is um, fetal derived tissue. But all of the others, the Blue Rock, the uh, Kyoto and the uh, International Stem Cell and the Chinese um, studies, they're all using um, embryonic stem cell based approaches. And there is a general consensus now, this is, well, this, in my personal opinion, there seems to be a general consensus now that we have reached a point where the um, embryonic stem cell derived cells, um, the, the recipes, the protocols are good enough to justify um, really sort of evaluating these, these cells um, at the clinical stage. And in addition to these companies and organizations here, there are a number of very large players who are about to enter this market, or this field, excuse me, I shouldn't say market, but field. Um, so in the next 12 to 18 months, you're gonna see a lot of activity with regards to um, stem cell-based therapies for Parkinson's. Just before I finish, I just wanted to make some comments with regards to future directions. And gene therapy is gonna be one of those future directions. There's a lot of ongoing um, clinical trials already at the moment. There's the Exavant and um, Voyager 
uh, studies which are taking more symptomatic approaches. They, these are deliveries of um, AADC, an enzyme involved in the production of dopamine into the putamen. And then you also have the PREVAIL um, trial kicking off as well very shortly. Um, but there's the 21st century gold rush at the moment where research groups around the world are conducting massive screens of variants of AAV viruses. Um, AAVs are being um, analyzed primarily because they have very little immune response. Uh, they've got a limited payload, so using um, exotic approaches such as CRISPR are uh, sort of problematic in that you can't fit it all into the, in the virus. But the, um, the screens are all looking for viruses that will not only cross the blood-brain barrier, but also only infect brain cells. So um, we potentially one day have a non-invasive, where holes are not being drilled into the brain, um, but simply an IV is being put in your arm, uh, where a virus will be delivered, and that will only um, transfect cells in the brain, or ideally the cells of interest in the brain. So that's something to um, keep an eye on. This is a rather blue sky at the moment, but um, with the pace of research in Parkinson's, nothing would surprise me if we don't see something like this at a clinical level in the next five years. <laughs> um, subtyping is another future direction, and um, maybe Alice is going to talk about this um, after coffee break, but um, no, gone are the days where we're simply testing compounds on a large cohort of ill-defined people with Parkinson's. And we're already seeing this with regards to um, some of the ongoing clinical trials. The Ambroxol study, for example, is focused on GBA, and we've got the Denali um, clinical trial program, which is focused on LARC2. Another um, future direction, and again, I don't want to steal anything from Alistair, um, is prodromal. Treating folks earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier, we're getting a much better idea now of, um, what, uh, of the individuals who are at risk of developing Parkinson's in the long term. So if we start treating them at a very early stage, as opposed to waiting until uh, um, a lot of your generative processes have already taken hold. Um, I'm often asked at um, support groups when I talk, what's going to work? And my answer is twofold. Number one, it depends on what type of Parkinson's you have. And number two, I don't expect any of this stuff to work. <laughs> and you can imagine that doesn't go down very well. But it's, it's the wording that I'm using. It's not, that, it's not that I'm not hoping that all of it will work. It's, it is that I'm not expecting it to work. A large part of my daily job is managing expectations. And expectations in the community are something like this, but we all know in reality it's much more like this. And so a common theme, I'm off, uh, the, the, the one thing I will try to push with my talks is, while it's all very exciting, um, all this research, all this activity going on is very exciting, it is important that we uh, maintain, it is important that we appreciate that thus far nothing has worked. So we should not expect any, any, anything to change. And um, I um, promote a uh, philosophy of glasses completely empty. <laughs> if you have any expectations in life, you are going to be disappointed. Um, I have no expectations this um, in, my, in my life. This morning, the sun came up. It was amazing. <laughs> um, but more seriously, um, Martin Taylor up in Edinburgh, who started the Facebook Parkinson's uh, Research Interest Group, um, he is a young onset um, Parkinson's sufferer. Uh, he talks about positive realism. Um, we need to be realistic in our um, hopes and aspirations for these clinical trials, and people sh certainly shouldn't be going into them expecting um, miraculous things to be happening. Um, there is reasons for optimism, though. I, do, I don't leave the crowd on that negative note. Um, if you look at all the research that's been done in the last 200 years since James first described um, uh, Parkinson's, 80% um, of it's been done in the last 20 years. And if you look at just the last 18 months, 10% of it has been done in just that period of time, uh, which is rather remarkable. Um, and I appreciate that PubMed hasn't been around for the whole 200 years, but um, <laughs> I like the... It's, it's a positive note to end on. 
So I hope I haven't bored you to tears with my shopping list of various approaches that are being taken for um, uh, targeting of disease mechanisms in Parkinson's. And um, I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Fabulous, Simon. I was so keen to involve you in that session. It's a fantastic overview of where we've got to. Uh, one of the mantras of the masterclasses of the Parkinson's Academy is there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, <laughs> so please don't feel in any way intimidated into not asking a question. Questions for Simon. Are there any such, is there such a thing as a stupid answer? <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a glass that's already empty, it can only get yes, better. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Questions? Some of it sounds a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? But of course we were saying that about MS 10 years ago, and now we've got disease-modifying therapies. It's extraordinary how the world's changed. If you think about what would happen with PD, if suddenly we had a disease-modifying therapy, absolutely changed practice. I, don't, I don't, don't mean to talk up the Cure Parkinson's Trust. I've only been with the organization for um, nine months. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but, um, it, it, is, it is interesting. We're going to be celebrating our 15th anniversary next year. And when the, when the organization first started out, um, there were four co-founders. Um, and when they first started, they, were, they wanted cure. They didn't, want to, they didn't want care. They wanted cure. And everybody thought they were mad, utterly mad, for um, taking this mindset. Because, you know, it's not possible. Cure is not possible. But it's been interesting to watch from the sideline, from my perspective, as there has been this shift from no such thing to maybe it is possible, maybe, it is, maybe there's potential here. And the exenatide um, result, even though it is just motor features, um, has certainly sh shifted the needle, um, not only within the Parkinson's community, I think, but also within folks within the cl um, clinical field as well. There's a consistent theme around N equals one, because um, as, as, as Baz was saying, and of course in clinic, N does equal one, it's the patient in front of us. Um, you're starting to talk here about subtypes of Parkinson's, about profiling, personalized medicine, even that. It's something Ray Chowdhury talks about a lot. So treatments for different types of PD. Yes. Yeah. That's certainly the way it's going. Uh, questions, anything? Yes. Yeah, so on the note of personalized medicine, I think when these therapies uh, are tried out and I think it's important to know which of these mechanisms is predominant. As we know, there are many phenotypes of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So in a particular patient, one mechanism might be more predominant, say like the misfolding of the proteins. So I think, so if a therapy is approved, I think it should not be just been given as a blanket therapy to all idiopathic Parkinson's patients. We should be more personalized. So there should be some more detailed, you know, looking into which mechanism is predominant in that particular patient. I don't know what your thoughts are. And I think the prodrome is very important because by the time we diagnose the Parkinson's disease, uh, a lot of destruction of the neurons has already taken place. So the, I think the, the, the question would be where, when this therapy should be uh, impl implemented. It should be mainly the pre prodrome, but maybe in some patients it might be when the, there is already the Parkinson's, medicine, the Parkinson's disease already set in. I mean, I don't know what your comments are. I think it needs to be more personalized than just a general, you know, blanket. Yeah, and, yeah exactly, uh, indeed. Um, and I think the issue at the moment for the field is that, number one, we're very poor at assessing Parkinson's, and number two, we don't have the biomarkers. But there's a great deal of work going on um, in the biomarker approach, um, not only from the standpoint of um, trying to identify specific types of Parkinson's, but also in the clinical trials. The exenotide study, for example, is taking brain-derived exosomes from blood to um, show target um, interaction. And that's a fantastic little, ass little assay you could do um, for every single clinical trial just to prove that the, the mechanism is occurring in the brain appropriately. But the, yeah, the lack of biomarkers, um, and there's a tremendous amount of work being done by the research community um, in this direction. And then, um, as Bass was alluding to before, better methods of assessment to determine these subpopulations sub um, is critical. Again, um, Alistair's probably going to discuss some of this in his talk, so I'll, I'll leave it with him. 
Thank you. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Because if you say, what's the effect of X in Parkinson's disease, the next question is, what's Parkinson's disease? And interestingly, in the MDT studies, if you narrow down your outcome to say, what's the effect of this intervention on falls, specifically, rather than PD, then the whole research study becomes more elegant and more focused. Um, do we understand the etiology of Parkinson's disease sufficiently to get to that stage? <laughs> Cup is completely empty, Guy. <laughs> Um, well, 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 one, one question which is probably good for me to ask this audience here is throughout history, throughout medical history, my, my, my poor understanding of it all is that we've always had medicine before mechanism. In the 10th century, we were inoculating people in China, and it's only recently that we've just sort of understood the immunological aspects of that. Um, has, have things changed? We've stopped bloodletting therapeutically. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Indeed. But, but, but just, uh, do we, do we, are we still, do we, ha do I, have we reached the point where we're getting mechanism before we get, um, are there examples of mechanism before, uh, beyond Gleevec, for example, was maybe the best example. Gleevec was targeted. That was a very specific, um, t specifically targeted drug. But um, in a lot of other cases, it, it's still accidental discovery. Um, so my question is, ha have things changed? Are we... S oh, yes, Camille. He's got the answer. So the one, the one uh, drug that you didn't men mention, of course, is simvastatin. Forgive me. <laughs> Which is a case in point. Potentially with utility, so it's being trialled in MS because the phase two study was positive, uh, but the mechanism is probably wide and fairly ill-defined. Uh, just so people don't know, uh, Camille, uh, close to recruitment now, or are you still recruiting? Oh, yes, close to recruitment. And last patient, last visit will be March, May next year. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Good. One final question before um, we break for coffee. Thanks for the interesting talk. I'm Sam Abraham. I'm just wondering, any research happening on uh, front or temporal dementia with Parkinson's? I mean, I'm from North Wales region. We tend to have a few more patients than usual in that side. Frontotemporal dementia with Parkinson's. So one, one, this is beyond my area of expertise. I focus purely on Parkinson's, I'm afraid. But one company I was describing here, um, Prevail. Prevail have um, plans for frontotemporal dementia and a gene therapy approach, uh, which they describe on their website. Um, that could be one to, to watch. Right, uh, time for coffee. We have half an hour back sat down at 11.15. Can I thank Simon and also Baz for their fantastic contributions to open the day.